All right, guys. So I have Lady Carnivory, uh, who is also known by her real name, JC, on the channel today. Hi, Scott. And how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Good. So uh, I'm very interested to chat with you. I know you want to talk about SIRS, which is chronic inflammatory Sorry, what is it again? Uh, sorry, response there's like syndrome? a fruit fly in my room right now. Uh, it's chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Uh, response. It's also okay. known as SIRS or SIRS. I'll probably say it both ways because I can't decide which one's correct. Okay. So very interested to hear about that. But uh, maybe just give us a bit of a rundown first as to what your life is all about. And I'd love for you to also share your channel and your MeFam uh, thing that you have going on Facebook, because I love it. So can you tell us all about that? And then we'll get, uh, get on to Sears or Sears. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm a two-year carnivore. I started my journey back in January of 2020. It's been quite a ride for me. Um, I have not had the most linear of carnivore journeys, but through that, I've done a lot. I um, trained and competed in a bikini competition. I do recipe development. I coach other carnivores, and I have a Meat Fam Facebook group. So it's a free Facebook group. We do a couple calls a week. Um, anyone is welcome to join us. Um, if you want to check out my recipes, ladycarnivory.com is a good place to go for that. I also have a YouTube channel, Lady Carnivory, but I'm probably most active on Instagram at Lady Carnivory. Awesome. And so can you also share a bit of like your background as to what your story is? I know we've done a video already, but um, just for people who, who don't know your story, maybe just a brief rundown of it. Yeah. Cliff Notes version. Here we come. So as a kid, I ate standard American diet. Like uh, one of the biggest foods I remember from my childhood was uh Oh my goodness. What is it called? Hamburger helper. Do you remember that? Oh, I love, Oh yeah. Yeah. Lots of that hamburger was my helper. Jam. That was my, my jam back in the eighties, like all, all week. That's all I eat. That yeah, and, and lunch, lunchables. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The pizza ones. So good. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> if it, I never understood when kids had like the cracker and cheese one. It was like, dude, your parents got so close. They got, yeah, so, they, they were totally so got gypped. I yeah. know you have to put the pizza sauce on and it's make like the, the little, oh, it was brilliant. So good. Um, anyways, um, as I got into my teenage years, I started becoming very body conscious. And so I did a few things simultaneously. I became a vegetarian, developed eating disorders, and was diagnosed with OCD. Um, as I got older, I overcame the eating disorders, but I still had OCD and I started developing lower back and joint pain. I always thought this was because of scoliosis. Um, but eventually I got into keto and then I got into carnivore and the joint pain that I had always had went away. Um, and then, you know, I started working out more. And because of that, I decided to pursue a dream of mine that I had had for a really long time, which was to do a bikini competition. And I did that. It was a very exciting experience. I had a great time. I don't know that I would ever do it again. Um, but following that, I actually developed some really weird symptoms. Um, I had uveitis, which is inflammation of the inner eye, plantar fasciitis, uh, enthesis or enthesitis, which is inflammation of the tendons and ligaments around joints. Um, and then I had some GI issues for a period of time. So that led to a lot of doctor's appointments and imaging, and they diagnosed me with non-radiographic ankylosing spondylitis. Um, none of the traditional treatments for AS has worked for me. Um, I belong to this low no starch group on Facebook. It's the low no starch group for ankylosing spondylitis. And everyone on there swears if you do a carnivore diet for like a week, your flare of AS will be gone. And it's, I'm like, I've been carnivore for two years. Like I'm not feeling okay. Um, and so that kind of led to uh, nutrition with Judy. I'm sure you're familiar with her reaching out to me and saying like, Hey, this isn't normal. I think you might have SIRS, um, which is again, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So that's kind of how I got into the rabbit hole I'm in now. Oh, Scott, you're muted. Sorry, my bad. Uh, did you watch my video with Jennifer by any chance? I, I did one last week with her and she had the same condition as you. Yes. Um, I know she mentioned with her ankylosing spondylitis, it did get better. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but did, so did you, you had um, some great progress in the beginning and then it kind of flared up again. 
Yeah, so I probably had like uh, ankylosing spondylitis is one of those things where you have the genetic predisposition and then there's some sort of environmental trigger. So I've always had the genes for it. Um, and I don't know what triggered it specifically. I have some guesses. Um, I think the prep for my show was quite hard on my body for one, um, but I also got involved with like some C word stuff, um, you know, that, that C word uh, that I think may have contributed as well, but I can't prove anything. Um, it's likely that carnivore when it helped my joint pain was actually holding that ankylosing spondylitis in remission. Um, but now I don't even believe I have ankylosing spondylitis. Like I don't even, okay, this is gonna be a strong statement, but I don't, I'm not even sure that like autoimmune diseases are a thing. I think all of it is actually SIRS. And if you treat the SIRS, you're treating the autoimmune condition. So that's kind of where I'm at now with that. Okay, yeah, that's that's an interesting theory. Um, so I might be a good segue into leading into talking about that because I know that's something that you're super interested in right now. Um, so you said that uh, Judy Cho got you onto it. Mm -hmm. um, so can you sort of break down that that conversation? Like, did she she just contacted you and said, "I want you to look into this kind of thing," and and what was sort of like your response to that? Like how, how did this sort of all manifest? Yeah, so she reached out to me. I had posted a story where I was just, I had met with my rheumatologist and the treatment that I thought was kind of my last resort, I found out like wasn't even gonna work for me. Um, and so I just broke down. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna be in pain for the rest of my life. Like, this is it. This is how I get to live. I don't get to, you know, do my favorite things. I don't get to weightlift anymore. I don't get to like have my brain back. I just get to be this broken human for the rest of my life. Like I was just, I was upset and crying on these stories and saying really sad things. Like, I think, you know, suicidal ideation isn't something that's talked about very much, but definitely when you are in a situation of stress, you're brain tries to figure out every escape route. And so I was having like suicidal thoughts. I was like, I can't live like this. Um, and so what are my alternatives? So I was in those stories. I shared those thoughts and those feelings and she happened to watch them and she reached out to me and she's like, you need to look into SIRS. Like this is a marker of SIRS that people become depressed and have suicidal ideation. So that plus your symptoms really seems like this is something you should look into. And at first I kind of blew her off. Like I blew off nutrition with Judy. And that was a mistake on my part. Um, but I, no, I just thought, can't do that. <laughs> I know, like, what am I doing? Um, but it's one of those things where it was like, you know, when they diagnose you with something, it's like, they just tell you what it is in different words, like ankylosing spondylitis. Like I know my joints are in pain, but you calling it arthritis doesn't change my experience of it. So I thought it was something like fibromyalgia, where it's like, you have inflammation of the fibers in your muscles. Like that's not helpful. It just describes what you're experiencing differently. And so when she told me she thought I had SIRS, it took me doing like 20 hours of research over a weekend to finally like be on board and be like, okay, this could be what I have. And this is something that is treatable, is curable. And I think for a lot of people that have been suffering for so long, it's like, oh my gosh, here's a chance for hope of being normal again. So so what is it? Can you break it down for us? Because I'm still a little bit in the dark about it as well. So maybe if, and just, you know, in, in layman's terms as possible for people like me that, um, you know, don't, don't, you know, have the easiest time comprehending these, these health things. But um, yeah, just give us a breakdown as to what it is. Yeah, so chronic inflammatory response syndrome happens when somebody who has a genetic predisposition encounters a biotoxin that their body isn't able to eliminate. So normally in our lives, we're exposed to toxins all the time and our body has different detoxification processes to help us eliminate those toxins. But people who have a genetic predisposition to SIRS aren't able to eliminate specific toxins depending on their genes. I like to explain this as, have you ever been to Ikea and tried to build one of their furniture sets? And it's like all the icons of the people, but there's no words. Uh, yeah, I try to avoid Ikea, but I, I built a bookshelf from Wayfair last week and it was not fun. Okay. I'm the least handy guy around. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a good analogy for sure. So if you think of our genes as instruction sets, if you're getting like the name brand item, 
um, that would be like a good set of jeans where your body understands the instructions. But if you buy like the off-brand thing from Amazon that came from China and the instructions are like missing pages, that's what it's like when you have SIRS. It's like the biotoxin is a bomb in your body, but instead of being able to send out the specialized response units, all that SIRS is, is like a general response to inflammation in your body that creates more inflammation and just recycles it. If you had the good instruction site, it would send out the bomb squad, which would be like your antibodies. Um, but it can't because it has really bad instructions. And so you're just stuck with general inflammation recycling in your body and those biotoxins recycling as well. Okay. So, so what would be the treatment for that? Like, what do you have a, a like an organized plan with your coach or, or what, what are you doing for that? So you do have to see a provider who can prescribe. There's only two binders that can actually eliminate these biotoxins. I know a lot of people are going to be familiar with like normal detox processes where you would use something like charcoal or clay. Those won't work for SIRS. You need a specific receptor size and you need a specific charge to the binder. So the guy who found SIRS, he was trying to treat a woman who had secretory diarrhea, which is a symptom of SIRS. And so he prescribed her an old school um, cholesterol medication. It's not a statin, it's a bile acid sequestrant. And so what it does is it like changes your metabolism of fats, um, but it eliminated her diarrhea, but it also eliminated all of her other SIRS symptoms. So they like accidentally stumbled upon this medication that could actually remove those biotoxins, but you do have to get it from a prescribing physician. Okay. And what's like, is there like a duration of treatment for that or? Yeah. So th that's not even the first step of the protocol. So th the cool thing about SIRS is like, there's a, um, diagnostic, uh, standard that you can actually check to see if you have SIRS at home, you have to have eight of the 13 symptom clusters, and then you have to fail. It's called this VCS test. It's a vision contrast sensitivity test. Um, people who have SIRS lose the ability to distinguish blurred lines. If you have eight of the 13 symptom clusters and you also fail the VCS test, then you should look into doing blood work. And at the point you do blood work, they, they take a look at your genetic haplotypes to see um, what biotoxins you might be sensitive to. And then they also check blood markers for the innate immune systems. Normally on like autoimmunity blood work, you would get results for things like rheumatoid factor, but because it, the actual like innate immune system hasn't handed over to the adaptive immune system, which would actually produce antibodies, you won't see that in your blood work. So people who are testing for like normal autoimmunity stuff are missing out on looking for these markers for uh, SIRS. So once your doctor has an understanding of what your blood markers are, they'll come up with the protocol for your treatment. The first step is lipid therapy because cholestyramine is a cholesterol medication. It will strip your cells of good fats. So you have to do a bunch of therapy to make sure you're bulking up those fats in your body, um, making sure that your ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 is correct. Um, and then you would start the binder. Um, you should, after four weeks on the binder, be able to pass the VCS test. And that would be your trigger to move on to the next step of the protocol. And the rest of the protocol, you aren't removing the biotoxin anymore. You're just fixing the downstream effects. Okay. So I, I know that like in our last conversation, you went over your blood work a little bit and you said that you had some abnormalities in your blood work. Um, were those ab abnormalities, is that associated with SIRS as well? And can you sort of list some of those for us and like, just so we can know what to look out for? Yeah, um, so SIRS blood work is really specific. Like I said, it's not those normal markers you would be looking for in like autoimmunity. So it is something you have to like specifically work with a provider who's willing to help you look for those things for. Um, but it's, it's stuff like traditional stuff, kind of like CRP and ESR, like it'll look at that kind of stuff. Um, but then it also looks at, at your uh, TGF beta one, it looks at your MMP9, it looks at your MSH. So MSH is melanocyte stimulating hormone. It has a ton of different effects in the body. Um, and if it is low, you have a lot of like catastrophic impact in your body. So one of the things, um, low MSH can cause is leaky gut or like traditional GI autoimmune diseases. Um, 
high TGF beta one can cause tissue remodeling and joint pain like that. I, my TGF beta one is super high because that's one of my biggest symptoms. It's interesting, you know, um, for, for myself, I could just say that my, like my body's, I, I feel like just littered with inflammation, right? Like I've gastritis, I have, every time they, they do scopes of me, they're like, oh, your stomach's on fire. And I have chronic pelvic pain syndrome and all these other sort of, uh, inflammatory conditions, but my CRP and my sorry, ESR, right. Mm -hmm. They've always been like extremely low. So, um, do these markers, are they specific to more like autoimmune or what you would maybe call SIRS is like, are those like definitive markers? So yes and no. So the ESR and CRP, they're just checking to see, um, like how acute the biotoxin exposure could be. So okay. initially those numbers will shoot up super high. So for example, for me, my CRP pre all of this happening was one, it should be one under one is normal. Right. Um, and then when I started having the AS symptoms, it was 15. That's on like one is the range. Like it goes zero to one and mine was right. 15. Sorry. Yeah. And so I just want to clarify that. So what I meant by definitive is like, if, if your CRP and ESR are low, does that mean that you don't fit the criteria to have SIRS? No, the, so like I said, this ERP and the ESR, they're just checking to see how acute the biotoxin exposure was okay, for the okay. actual SIRS blood markers. Um, it's TGF, MMP9, C3A, C4A, and MSH. Those are the markers they actually look at. To, if you, I think you have to have three, two or three of the four in order to like qualify as a SIRS patient. So you have to have eight of the 13 symptoms. You have to fail the VCS test. You have to have the genetic haplotype that says you might have SIRS. You have to have, I can't remember if it's two or three of the blood markers that would be diagnostic of SIRS. And then the last diagnostic criteria is that you get better with treatment. And how many of those blood markers did you serve sort of like, you know, were sort of like off, I guess I should say abnormal for you to to make that diagnosis? All four of those were abnormal for me, but it's, oh, okay. you don't have to have all four abnormal. If you have the genetic haplotype, like if you've gotten that far in the process and you have two to three that are wrong, um, that, that are abnormal, um, then you very likely have SIRS and you should work with a SIRS provider to make sure you're doing the protocol correctly. Mm. So I know you've been carnivore for, for quite some time now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I, I, I like about you is you're not so dogmatic about it in, in a lot of ways. Um, do you feel like the carnivore diet is still right for you in terms of healing your condition? I mean, you, um, you're still, you know, you're still having your health issues and stuff like that. Have you thought about transitioning over to maybe a different type of diet or so that's hard for me to answer. I don't know that um, carnivore is the best diet to treat SIRS. I know that um, SIRS providers recommend low amylose and low mold diets. And there's kind of like a Venn diagram of where those two things meet. But there are plenty of people who have done like standard American diet and done gone through a SIRS protocol and gotten better. For me, I know I mentioned earlier that I was diagnosed with OCD when I was 15 and eating a carnivore diet is the only thing that has ever alleviated that for me. I used to be on medications for it. I did behavioral therapy for it and nothing ever changed my status with my OCD until I tried carnivore. So for me, it's not about um, necessarily my physical health, um, but for my mental health, like I can't imagine having SIRS and OCD, like that would just not be a good time. So even if I thought, um, you know, there was some benefit to eating a different food, if I knew that it would bring my OCD back, that would be a very hard decision for me to make. Yeah. And one thing I, I really feel like I connect with you on is that, you know, carnivore, you know, a lot of people I talk to. I mean, if you go in the groups, you'll see it. it. It kind of seems like this magical cure for everybody and everyone gets better right away. And we talked about this, right? And, um, but there's a, a huge subset of people I talked to that where that isn't the case, right? A lot of people don't get better right away or um, it might take a lot, a lot of time or maybe some people just don't get better on it. Some people, um, in, in fact, don't even 
see improvements on they actually get worse you know and um there could be a lot of pitfalls of, of carnivore as well so um I mean, do do you find that do you find that frustrating? Like, is that something that has has impacted you? Sort of seeing all these success stories, like I just mentioned, like that girl Jennifer, mm. who has AS, and and she kind of just felt better right away, kind of thing. And uh, do you think there's any any reason why somebody with AS, um, you know, would get better with carnivore, and some people wouldn't? Do you have any ideas or theories behind that? Yeah. So first of all, like, I'm just super happy for Jennifer. Um, I like just knowing what that pain is like, like anyone who's able to cure their whatever with carnivore, like I am so happy for them. I don't have any resentment towards that, but I do take issue with people who like when people are not getting better, they're like, oh, you just need a carnivore harder. Like you need to, you need to restrict more. You need to go to one type of meat. You need to do no salt. You need to, it's like, okay, this isn't working for me. And you're telling me to do the thing that isn't working for me harder than I already am. And it's just like, it blows my freaking mind that people think that's okay. Um, Now in retrospect, I kind of think, so 25% of the population has the genetic predisposition for SIRS. And um, if you kind of look at carnivores, like people being willing to try a diet, that's pretty extreme. Let's admit it's pretty extreme. Um, I think that the ratio of people who possibly have SIRS in the carnivore community is a lot higher. So for those people who aren't getting better, like I would just encourage them. There's two steps you can do at home. They cost $0 to see if you might have SIRS. Check the symptoms to see if you have eight of this, the 13 symptom clusters and do the VCS test at VS, vcstest.com. You can do it for free. Just don't um, do the like questions where you enter like your symptoms, just do the vision part. And if you fail it, you might want to move forward. Okay. Um, and I might spin this off into a different video, but what is, what is JC lady carnivory eat in a day? I'm, I'm just curious. What does your day typically look like? Or is it sort of different from day to day? It's different day to day. And with the SIRS, I'm actually having histamine reactions to foods. So like pre all of this, a normal day of eating for me would have been like eggs and bacon for breakfast and then probably like um, chicken or ground beef for lunch and then steak for dinner. That would have been a very normal day of eating for me. Um, But since I've had SIRS, I've kind of gone through phases of like things my body is okay with. Um, So right now I'm eating like a lot of bratwurst. For some reason I can eat bratwurst, which is terrible. Like that's a terrible carnivore food. That's not even like clean carnivore but it's like what my body craves right now. So I'm just like, all right, if this is what you want to eat, I'm going to let you eat it. And I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. Right. Because I think that then if you eat the meat you like can afford, it makes you feel your best. You're going to be able to do carnivore sustainably. I fully recognize with my mental health issues, I may have to do carnivore for the rest of my life. And so I personally want to make it as easy, enjoyable and sustainable as possible. I'm not on this like weird race to zero, making it difficult for myself by restricting to ruminant, no salt, blah, blah, blah. If that makes you feel your best, do it, but not me. Yeah, absolutely. I hear you. I go through periods where I get get those histamine issues. In fact, I'm going through one right now. If you could see how dry my skin is, mm. um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I find that certain meats I just don't do well with at all. And sometimes I could get away with it. You know, it really just depends. But uh, eggs has always been a tough one for me. Um, I might sometimes if I'm really craving eggs, I might go for like one yolk kind of thing. But um, I've I've fallen off the the lion diet bandwagon. I just I didn't want to do that anymore. I was doing that for a long time. And now I'm I'm incorporating like salmon and chicken, and I'm enjoying life so much more bringing those meats in. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting it's great. when you look at it too. Um, you know, there's so much nutrition in all these different types of meats. Ruminant meat is really great. I'm not going to deny that ruminant meat is very good for us, but like pork is full of B vitamins. B vitamins and salmon is really great for the omega-3 ratio. So I think when we're just kind of um, arbitrarily knocking out entire meats because um, we're following someone who that worked for and that's fine. Um, But is it really working for you? Like, is it really working for your lifestyle? Are you really noticing a difference in restricting to that one type of meat or even that one method of carnivore? 
Yeah, that's just it, right? And um, people are always telling you like, oh, you have to have like a certain fat to protein ratio and you have to get in certain electrolytes. And I find it's like very individual, right? Because I, I know for myself, like when I tried upping my fat, um, it absolutely tanked my digestion. You know, I was eating these like fatty cuts of lamb and stuff like that. And uh, I told you about my pork belly story last week <laughs> and uh, it just, it destroys my stomach, right? I think for somebody with SIBO and I think, a lot of us have SIBO, you have fat malabsorption issues. And um, so following these sort of dogmatic rules with carnivore, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. I, I totally agree with you. I think it's like super individual. Um, some people do better just seeing steak, you know, but to be honest with you, I, I thought that the long, for the longest time because that's what everybody was telling me, but I feel like I'm doing better just, you know, introducing all these different types of meats. And I feel, like I, I have better nutrition than I used to as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm wondering about the histamine issues, sort of what the missing component is, because my idea on it is that, you know, carnivore seems to really help people with their symptoms, but it's in some respects, I mean, it's not normal that, you know, you go back to eating, I don't know, a piece of cauliflower after a month or two and you, your stomach blows up and you get crazy reactions and stuff like that. Right. Like, I feel like, you know, if it was actually curing your condition that that kind of stuff shouldn't be happening. Like you should be able to reintroduce other foods eventually. And so I'm wondering what the, what the missing component is. Like I I've been reading a lot of like the gaps diet and, you know, Dr. Natasha, um, you know, says to you have to eat fermented foods to heal, or you have to maybe uh, drink meat stock or whatever, right? But I mean, <clears throat> I mean, no one really knows, right? What 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 the what the what the what the difference is between healing leaky gut and it's. I mean, it's just it's so hard to figure this stuff out. I I'm, I feel like I'm getting very frustrated at this point trying well, to figure it out. So I'm not going to say it serves as a panacea diagnosis, but there, there's some like specific issues in the biotoxin pathway that causes MCAs and histamine reactions in leaky gut. I talked to you about the melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is important for regulating the tight junctions in the gut, causing leaky gut. So if your MSH oh, okay. is low, you might have leaky gut, but there's another pathway where, um, so essentially SIRS is the liberation of your immune system. What happens is because you have so much inflammation, your cortisol goes through the roof and cortisol is good in um, certain respects. It's what regulates your immune system when you do have a lot of inflammation, but your cortisol stays so high for so long, eventually your body shuts it down because it doesn't want to um, negatively impact your health you can't sustain cortisol levels that are that high for so long. And so your body actually shuts it down. And when it shuts it down, the cortisol stops regulating your immune system. So that's when you get histamine reactions and MCAs and stuff like that. Um, so it's really fascinating, you know, digging into the SERS stuff and just having a lot of the dots connected for me and for like a lot of people that I'm sharing this information with. It's like, it's so easy to see if you might have it just you know, look at the symptoms, do the vision test. And then if you don't, don't go any further and that's fine too. And I'm not saying that this is going to be a cure-all for everyone, but I know a lot of us have been suffering for a long time. So it's fascinating to me that this does seem like to be an answer for many. Hmm. You know, I've never really thought of that before. Yeah. So inflammation is, is a huge trigger for cortisol increase increases, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So in SIRS, your body recognizes that there's a foreign invader from the biotoxin. And so your cortisol shoots up as your immune system tries to get rid of the biotoxin. But for, again, for the SIRS people, they can't produce the antibodies they need to actually eliminate the toxin. And so you just stay in the state of innate inflammation and your cortisol is super high. Interesting. Okay. Sorry, your cortisol is super high until your body shuts down and then it's super low. So that's another interesting blood marker for SARS people. Okay. They have crazy inflammation in these innate immune markers like the TGF, the MMP9, the MSH, but then their cortisol will be low, like abnormally okay. low. Yeah, because I've noticed that when I get, you know, um, 
you know, these inflammatory sort of uh, flares and everything that, that my cortisol seems to go up pretty high and I, I have really bad like MCAS, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's interesting. I never really pieced those together for some reason. Um, okay, Lady Carnivory, is there anything else you wanted to add to that? No, thanks for having me on. Thanks for letting me talk about SIRS. It's kind of my new favorite subject. I just think it's it's a hope for a lot of people, a lot of us who never thought we would have a chance for healing. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I would really like to see? I'd really like to see you on Nutrition with Judy. You guys do a podcast about it. Oh my God, I would die. That's, <laughs> it's like bucket list item for me. Well, we need to petition uh, Nutrition with Judy to get Lady Carnivory on and uh, talk about this stuff. Cause I think it is very important. I think there's a lot of people who are dealing with it. And I think it's a really interesting theory that, um, you know, that, that it could be SIRS instead of, you know, the sort of broad diagnosis of just autoimmune disease, right? Mm -hmm. We just like to throw that out there, autoimmune disease. Everyone, everything's autoimmune disease instead of getting to sort of the root cause of it. Yeah, well, it makes so, sense. Like if SIRS has liberated your immune system, it's going to be autoimmune. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's really cool. So um, I'm going to link uh, JC's information down below. Link the Meat Fam. You guys should really join that. It's a really cool group. And uh, also your Instagram and YouTube channels. What's going on with your YouTube uh, channel these days, by the way? Oh man, I haven't posted in a while. Um, I have a bunch of uh, like, they're just audio podcasts of people sharing their autoimmune stories that I've been working through editing. Um, so that's probably going to be the next couple of things that come out. But um, obviously I'm on this serious journey now and I'm hopeful that I'll start treatment starting on um, hopefully shortly after June 7th. And then as I get better, I'm hoping I have more bandwidth to do a lot of the projects I want to do like the SERS content. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think we have the future nutrition with JC coming up. Oh my goodness. I'm, I would just, <laughs> I'm such a big fangirl of hers. I, I, I would die. <laughs> well, that's why I keep mentioning her because I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with her channel as well. I've, I've watched a lot of videos of hers. So um, I don't think that uh, she gets enough recognition. She asks very good questions and she has lots of great guests on there. So yeah. Maybe I'll link Nutrition with Judy. If you guys haven't seen that, you guys should check it out. The thing I like most about her is like, I feel like carnivores in the carnivore community, like people interview the same people over and over. Um, but she actually brings in people from kind of the outside other sciencey realms. And she just has them kind of speak to their area of expertise. And I, I find it fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, JC, thanks so much for coming on again. Um, I hope uh, we could do a follow-up once uh, you've sort of undergone more treatment and just see how things are going. And I really wish you the best. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Stop.